Welcome to our show, Leyes Cotidianas. I am your host, Luis Perez Iguarte, and today we're going to be talking about child support. And we have as our guest, uh, Mr. Charles Schrake, Special Assistant Attorney General at the Division of Child Support Services of the Department of Human Services in Winnet Judicial Circuit. Welcome, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. accepting our invitation. And we also have uh, Mr. Jesus Nerio, a private practitioner and a good friend of, uh, of this program. <laughs> Jesus, welcome back. It's always a Thank pleasure. Thank you for, ha for coming here today to discuss this topic that, you know, it's a little um, controversial sometimes perhaps or important when, you t when, you, when it involves the Hispanic community. Um, Mr. Shrek, if you can just give us a, a small explanation of what exactly is that your agency does um, when it comes to... Uh, to starting child support, uh, child support uh, uh, petitions. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> the state has a vested interest in protecting children, and so we, through an assignment of rights, which means the custodian comes in and requests services of the state of Georgia to either establish child support order or enforce a child support order that already exists, or the third alternative is obviously to modify, and uh, we'll come back to that, because the modification, either party, whether the non-custodial or custodial parent can come and request services for that. But as far as the, the primary one, we do do establishment and do the, the whole process as far as uh, establishing support, establishing a, uh, an order for medical support, but we don't do child custody, visitation or alimony and we don't do divorces so those are the the primary services that we provide on the front end after you have an order whether it be an order of a divorce an order from another state or an order from child support services then you can always ask for us to do the, the services being enforcement enforcement or collection if the person is current on their uh, payments, then we have a way of processing the payments through the Family Support Registry and keeping a, a, an accounting of the, the monies that are received and we then disperse to the custodian. So that's one of the services we can provide after you get an order. And Jesus, where would a private petitioner come into this scheme? In two ways. The first would be if the custodial parent has filed with the state for child support from my client. Um, then my client is the non-custodial parent. That non-custodial parent has an obligation because he or she is a parent. And the law requires that a non-custodial parent pay child support to the custodial parent. What about if uh, paternity is being contested? I mean, would that be a preliminary step? It is a preliminary step and both the state as well as the uh, superior courts are very much interested in ensuring that a DNA test is accomplished so as to show that he or she, well he in this <laughs> case, <laughs> is or is not uh, the biological parent. Once uh, that paternity is established, then what is the process exactly? The process is that the state would then go forward and ask for what's called discovery. Um, what is it that uh, would require, in this case, my client, let's call him the father. Um, which is, you said in most cases is the non-custodial parent. Which in most cases is the non-custodial parent. He would then be required to provide tax returns or some form of a showing how much it is that he earns. Now, under the new statutes, new 2007, uh, basically both parents are responsible. So the custodial parent, which is the mother, would also have to show what her income is. And there are um, child support guidelines and worksheets. And sorry, let's make clear, not always the mother is the custodial. I mean, this roles can either, right? 99% of the time. 99%, I mean. The mother is the custodial parent. Okay, okay, okay. sorry to interrupt. And so now that you know, now that we, everybody knows uh, how much the father makes, how much the mother makes, then it's a question of calculating how much child support is due. That calculation being done is then presented to a judge. 
Uh, no, I'm sorry, who, who is the one who, do, who does this calculation then? Well, in most is it cases. An agency, your agency, or? Yeah. In, in most cases, in it cases, is. Right. In the cases that w we handle, we generally prepare a calculation which we attach to the um, petition. Essentially, Would this be like the, the a guideline for the judge? Uh, yes. But not, it's not binding it's on not the judge? It's not binding, but it is part of uh, where we start out. So, you know, we will prepare a worksheet. All the parties are, you know, expected or should if the um, non custodial parent believes that uh, our worksheet is incorrect or that that person wants to submit a worksheet that's and you would prepare another one Jesus? I would prepare one um, regardless of whether the, the regardless agency. of what they prepare and then there is a question for the judge to discern de decide which one is correct and here's where the uh, the big dilemma occurs um, the custodial parent say the mom is saying I can't raise my child with this amount of child support um, but the worksheets show this amount of child support. The father is saying, I can't pay this amount of child support and survive. And so the question then becomes, what can we prove in terms of um, salaries? Income and expenses? Expenses. Uh, are there any special conditions? Is insurance being paid? Is there child care being provided? Is the child care being provided by a family member that does not charge, or is there child care being provided by an agency, a child care, child care uh, uh, organization? All of those factors go into these worksheets. If the non-custodial parent, the father, uh, doesn't provide that information, they're going to go, uh, the state is going to use what the custodial parent, the mother, says he earns to without any documentation to ah. <laughs> back that information <laughs> in some instances yes. <laughs> but generally this, what the state does is they first look at sources that are available to the state department of labor records wage records and that's one area that, that we have access for both parties Which, when it comes to the Hispanic community maybe this is a little bit more difficult right, right. I and mean, it is because this documentation is not always available in most instances the person is an independent contractor yes. uh, and although the worksheets provide for that uh, they require that information to be in the form of a tax return so that the the documentation that is in the tax return is then transferred into the worksheets so that the calculation comes out correct. But in some instances, the n custodial parent, the mom, is going to say, wait a minute, he gets paid in cash, and that doesn't show up anywhere. And if the non-custodial parent, the father, is not ready to make a showing, they're going to use that information. They're going to use that information regardless of whether there's any evidence oh, or any... Only, I mean, obviously, if, he, if the non-custodial parent does not show up, doesn't participate, then it's a one-sided... Yes, well, uh, in that case, right. I imagine. But, I mean, right. if there's really nothing to... If both parties, sustain, if both parties are present, in which we, I mean, do they, we would do encourage... Do you investigate, I mean, and try to... Like I said, we, we will look at... Uh, what's out there as far as uh, for the real the, the record through like I said Department of Labor the other uh, area we what we can look at is as counsel said if he provides th through our discovery process pay stubs um, tax returns bank statements some indi indication of what this this person's financial status is we will use that and really it boils down to if she says one thing and he says another that's a question for the judge who acts as the jury in this case to decide which he finds more credible the other thing that we look at obviously is the type of employment and if if the type of employment what we can do is look at the department of labor department of labor wage survey so if a person is a carpenter and we can look and see what is the, the entry level, the average, and then also determine from there, especially in cases where people are self-employed. Self -employed. Right. I mean, so depending on the years of experience. Or exactly. Mm -hmm. And all of this gets into the mix, so it's not 
just taking her word for it or nor just taking his. Which, I mean, here you, I guess you need to take into account that perhaps they just divorced or separated. I mean, the parties are not in speaking terms and... Uh, or they were never married. Or they never, yeah. Yeah, and... Well, the you have to take that information with a grain of salt. I mean, The I biological suppose. father is always responsible for child support, whether they're married, not married, divorced, whatever. And th some of the, one of the problems that I'm, that I find in my practice with child support is that the non-custodial parent, the father, for example, works as an independent contractor, and he has three or four employees. And so the prime contractor writes him a check for $120,000. Um, and that $120,000 goes to materials, goes to pay the three or four other employees. But unless he can show through his taxes that out of that $120,000, he came out with $30,000, um, then the court would use uh, the $120,000 as well. Now, so, I mean, this is an incentive for people to keep their tax records, records straight and, and make sure that they file, be, you know, Absolutely. every year. Now, what about someone who doesn't have that much of a history in the state of Georgia or in the United States, some uh, new arrival? How would, you, how would the court calculate those payments? What would they use in this There's case? There's a, uh, <coughs> uh, if, if my client is unemployed, has been unemployed, and claims that because he's undocumented, he can't get a job, the law imputes, uh, makes provisions to say, you can earn a minimum, the minimum wage, 725. 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, divided by 12, comes out to 1,250 some odd Six dollars um, a month. So the, the, the law imputes and puts into your pocket what you should be able to make. What would happen if there's a child support determination and the, the person, the non-custodial parent, is removed from the United States, is deported? Would the agency, would the court be able to, in some way, go no. to a foreign country and enforce? Uh, no. Not, not in my practice, not, not that I have ever seen it. What can happen, though, is that that information and that arrearage mounts up. If and that a person ever returns. However, that is assuming, and I said like your practice, but if the, they go to a country that we have an agreement, an with, agreement with, with, let's say Mexico. Well, that would not be. <laughs> we don't have really? an agreement. I'm no. surprised. Uh, which country is uh, Let's say Latin Germany. America. But let's say any countries in Latin America. Mm, there are some. But in not. Germany, let's say... Let's say Germany, could, England. Could, um, right. We could then trans or send the order to the uh, agency that's in that country. And enforce where, it. Where this person is. And they would take that order, register it, for enforcement, and then they would pursue all enforcement activities. So we can in assume that, that for Latin America, if the person is that removed one. from the United States, that person is yes. not going to pay yeah. child support. That is. And that uh, registration, England or Germany or Greece, Greece I think also, uh, it, that order is the same type of order uh, that is transferred to another country from one state to another. So if the initial divorce occurred in California, and the party, the, the non-custodial parent is now living in Georgia, then that order from California comes to Georgia, and Georgia's obligation is enforce it. And we need to talk about this when we get back, but I uh, want to, I mean, county-wise, whether if one party lives in one county and another one in another one, mm -hmm. and move, or they move around, I mean, exactly how, how difficult it is to, to um, ju yeah, jurisdiction. Um, to start uh, the process, you said, the non-custodial parent would come to the agency oh, the or through a custodian. private... Uh, the custodial parent. The custodian, yes. Okay. And um, once they, they, they approach your agency, what exactly, what are the first steps that you take in order to represent this person? The person fills out an application, gives us the uh, legal documents that show uh, the, about the child, birth certificates and the like, uh, fills out a paternity statement paternity affidavit indicating uh, who the non-custodial parent is. So all of this being done, uh, there's wage information you know, for her. And then at that point, we make the determination of which office. You can apply online 
anywhere. And then at that point where we would determine where the non-custodial parent resides. Mm -hmm. And that's where then the file, which is not a legal, it's not a court case, it's just an application legal file, I mean a file within the agency gets transferred to that office for them to then uh, have To the county where the non-custodial non exactly. party is. Exactly. And then mm -hmm. from that point they go through uh, contacting that individual, try to get them in to see if they can come up with a settlement. What if there's uh, n almost no information as to, as to that individual? We I mean, do have locate services so they would come give us enough information for us to do some. Um, Jesus, can you really find the person where they you do. don't have your <laughs> they, do. <laughs> they do find them, and it's very difficult um, to get away with not paying child support. support. In our community, in the Hispanic community, it's the mother, the biological mother, the custodial parent that I don't want to bother him. Yeah. I don't want him to go to jail. <laughs> Let's, we'll get back to this as soon as we as we're return. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in just a minute. Thank you. Con inmensa alegría recordamos la época de nuestro embarazo, el nacimiento de nuestros hijos, nuestra preocupación para que se alimentaran, estudiaran y crecieran física y emocionalmente saludables. Permítanos guiarle a través de un embarazo seguro y feliz. Aprenda sobre salud, nutrición e información educativa. Padres e hijos Atlanta. La única revista para padres en Atlanta. Una publicación gratuita del mundo hispánico. We're back with the second part of our show, and we have as our guest uh, Lisa Shriver, uh, policy specialist with the Division of Child Support Services, and Iniabel Santiago, an enforcement agent with the Division of Child Support Services. Both of you, thank you for joining us today as we continue with this important topic of child support. And Liz, we were talking before uh, we went on the air about exactly what a, a, a policy specialist uh, does with uh, with the agency, and you seem to be pretty involved with uh, with with the entire process. I mean, helping put in, put together the file, helping with the calculations, and also you provide services in, in Spanish. Uh, is that right? Yes. If a customer comes into the office and English is not their primary spoken language, if someone requests a Spanish application, we can provide that. Uh, we can provide an interpreter in the office or over the phone. Uh, at no cost to the customer, or if they actually need to have some documents translated, we can also do that as well. And what about the, per the, the paternity test? I mean, we're talking about that. What, how do you, what do you need to do for this test? Is it a blood <laughs> test? No, no, no. <laughs> we have not done blood tests for a long time. We okay. do a, a swab on the inside of the cheek, and that can actually be done in-house. Uh, there's a training program that agents in the local offices go through to be certified specimen collectors. So when the non-custodial parent comes in, if he would like to request paternity testing, we can actually usually swab him that day in the office. And how long does it take to process this? Or it depends when the custodial parent and the child are drawn, uh, but usually it's no more than two weeks after that. So, so you have to take the swab, all three parties, and, and how accurate are those tests? Very accurate. If Very it's 97% or higher, then we consider that paternity has been established. And you require 97 percent? Is that like the threshold? Interesting, good. And uh, Inabel, um, you're an enforcement agent, so you really go out, I mean, you're the one in charge of making sure that people are paying uh, mm -hmm. child support. What are the main ways uh, that you enforce these this, this, uh, orders? Well, after the, the custodial parent apply for services and provide all the documents that we require, and we other uh, establish the order. Uh, we send an FIW, meaning the federal income we hold into the employer or possible employers, or um, or the NCP can start sending the payments to us. So wow. Number one way is through employment, through the salary, through the income. Exactly. Uh, it, it, it is withdrawn automatically. Exactly. And goes into a special account. They, or they will send the employer send the payments to the family support registry. And Which is, a, let's say, a special account. Uh, is the, uh, no, it's a unit that processes all the payments that we collect okay. and disperse those payments to the CP. In either a, to a the form of check. Uh, uh, a no, check now is a is, uh, debit card okay. or if she choose a direct uh, deposit. deposit. But I mean, goes straight into the, into the custodial parent account, account, right? Okay. And we're talking about the number two 
way of, uh, of enforcement. <laughs> and that is tell us um, about that? the intent of suspended driver license. That means if the non custodial parent is, is not paying, at least is behind for two months of the obligation, or 75 days of the obligation, um, we start the process, meaning we're going to send a letter to the non custodial parent telling them. And you send it directly to that person, not, not through uh, the agency, the, the DMV. I mean, you no. send that letter. Uh, right? Exactly. The system generates that, that letter to the non custodial parent telling that you are behind, you have 20 days, you can require a hearing. If you think that the arrears are wrong, or we have any information that is wrong, or you are not the person in this case, uh, or you can come in compliance with the agency. Or after that 20 days, uh, would the license be automatically suspended? Then or the, li the, um, the license, uh, the, will, the process will continue, and then the license will be suspended. Like, like you, you need to file with the DMV? He uh, the system will see that he's not in compliance, and then just D the DBS will suspend his driver license. And what do you would you say? Do you think most cases are? I mean, most people are in. I mean, they comply. As soon as they see the the, no the notification, uh, most of them go to the office and trying to come up in an agreement. Like uh, if they owe maybe thousand dollars, we can say, well, we can we can make extra payments. Uh, what we call a repay for those arrears. So in that way, we stop the process. So that legal action is, we're going to stop it. Excellent. And, and, and Liz, what percentage of the cases that you're seeing these days, would you say, come from the Hispanic community? I think in Gwinnett, we probably have around 20% uh, of our cases are uh, Hispanic, uh, non-custodial parents. The numbers are a little different for custodial parents. but. I would say it's well, has this been like a sharp increase in the past few years or Gwinnett has always been a really diverse community and it's not just the Hispanic population we have uh, it's very diverse oh, minorities, so. of course of course but would you say th I mean the Hispanic community has become the largest minority in, in Gwinnett think, County perhaps uh, I probably wouldn't say largest but when people become more familiar with our services and know that you know you don't have to be a citizen to apply for child support we don't. That's important to mention that you do not need to be a citizen to apply for child support. No. You do not need to have a legal status, right, to, yeah. to apply for child support. The only thing that we ask for is a, a picture ID. It can be from any government, state, local, uh, international, uh, a birth certificate or a certificate of birth for the child just to establish between the custodial parent and the child that parent-child relationship. But no proof of citizenship is required. and. Knowing in Gwinnett, we have an interpreter that's in the office at least two days a week. So knowing that you know there's no proof of citizenship and that you don't have to speak English to apply for services or receive or to receive services, I think has brought in more Hispanic customers over the years. And that's a good mm -hmm. thing. And what about these letters, um, Inabel? Are those letters issued in Spanish as well, or they're always in English? Uh, they're in, in English mainly. Has yeah. the agency thought about perhaps? Oh, that's that's a good suggestion. We I can mean, take that into. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people receive a letter in English and they really don't uh, don't know how to. But proceed. they see that uh, the letter when they get those letters, they always respond in some way. They call the contact center. They go to the office, and like Liz says, we have an interpreter there, and we have a, a language line that we can call them and. They can help us to translate. You know. Now, how many offices are there in the in the state? How many offices? I think we have over 50 offices okay, statewide. So I mean, most I mean, uh, most people are not far from an office where they can get yeah. the services. Yeah. If there isn't one in their county, there's one in their judicial circuit, and usually those so counties are attached. Point. So it's Excellent. within driving distance. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for all this information. Thank very, you very, very, very important, very useful for our community. Well, Liz and Inabel, thank you very much for joining us today. This was very useful information. And, and thank you very much uh, to you as well. Uh, please join us on our next show. And don't forget to visit our webpage, uh, www.leyescotidianas.com. Uh, visit us on Facebook. And you can also visit, our, visit us on YouTube, youtube.com slash leyescotidianas, where you can find all of our shows. Thank you very much and until next time. Leyes Cotidianas les llega a ustedes gracias al generoso apoyo financiero de la Fundación de Justicia Civil del Estado de Georgia. Mundo Hispánico.
el vocero de la comunidad hispana desde 1979. La estación transmisora WPBA no tiene licencia para practicar leyes en el estado de Georgia. WPBA y los patrocinadores de este programa no son responsables por las opiniones expresadas ni la información proporcionada por los abogados en este programa. Este programa se ofrece como un servicio público. El objetivo de este programa es de informar y educar y no de proveer consejo legal. Si usted necesita consejo legal, favor de consultar a un abogado.